Right. Well, thank you so much uh, to everybody who has come so far for this event uh, titled Configuring Sphinx from Scratch, Making Your Own Documentation and Making Your Documentation Your Own. Um, I'm your source host for the day. My name is Rachel Ainsworth. I'm a community manager at the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, like I just mentioned, this event is being recorded and it will be published online. Um, so we'll only record the talks. So any sort of um, discussion or networking done afterwards will not be recorded. Um, but if you do not want to appear in the video, uh, do please turn off your video and do keep your microphone muted to help us reduce the background noise. Um, and also just to note that the contents of the Zoom chat will not be recorded or published anywhere. So um, feel free to use that. Um, so we have lots of uh, exciting uh, events coming up as part of the SOURCE program. Um, you can see the full list of events in the full calendar on the SOURCE website. Um, there's a uh, rolling submission uh, call as well. So if you want to submit your own session, um, you can do so on the website as well. And there's also a mailing list to sign up to keep, keep appraised of all of the exciting upcoming events and news. Um, but yeah, so today we have a really exciting session, uh, Configuring Sphinx from Scratch, which will be led by uh, Sadie Bartholomew from the National Center for Atmospheric Science. We do have a code of conduct for the source events, uh, which is listed at this link here. So you are um, required to uh, abide by this code of conduct, but if you need to um, uh, get my attention for anything, you can message me in the chat, but otherwise um, you can see how to report anything via that code of conduct. And with that, I will hand over to Sadie. Oh, thank you very much, Rachel, <clears throat> for that introduction. Um, excellent. So as Rachel says, um, this talk is about Sphinx and configuring documentation with Sphinx. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now because that's going to be um, how I'm going to run this. Um, so let me just quickly. I was just double checking things were working. So let me just quickly um, open my um, introductory information and then I will share my screen. Um, okay. So I should be sharing my screen now. So if anyone can't see, then please give me a shout. Um, otherwise, I'll assume everything's fine. Um, so most of this is going to be based, um, or at least originate from the terminal. Um, so as I mentioned in um, the abstract, you should be familiar with some basic command line, um, well, basic commands, and know a little bit of Python, but that's all you really need is a prerequisite. Um, so I'm working from a repository that I'm going to push to GitHub. and. Um, everything will be up there. So just note that if you miss something or if you want to look into something, um, it should all be there. Um, once I've pushed that up, um, I'll push it up after I've completed the talk. So I'm actually going to start with just a plain text file where I cover some context. Um, because what I was, I was going to actually provide some slides to, to provide the context for this talk. But then I thought, why not actually incorporate the um, the context into the documentation we're going to build? Because this will be a good way to show you how to go from um, just some plain text, or in this case, some markdown, I guess. Um, if you're familiar with markdown, it's quite similar to plain text, but you can add some basic um, um, kind of features such as um, making headings using this this hash um, symbol um, and things like putting things in bold and italic, so basic formatting. Um, but the key to uh, building content with Sphinx is um, using this restructured text format. So I'm actually going to go from this um, text context I have, create, uh, move it to, to RST, and then we can use that to build the documentation itself. Um, so just to provide some context, um, so Rachel's already mentioned who I am. Um, now, I was thinking of giving a talk for, for this series of, of research software events, and I was thinking, uh, what could I talk about that would be of use to, to a lot of the community? Because I work in, in weather and climate, um, science. And I was thinking that might be quite niche for me to talk about something from weather and climate science, uh, science itself. Um, so I thought, why not talk about something that um, all, or at least most of us will um, at least encounter, if not um, develop themselves, and that's documentation. Um, so it's in a sense language agnostic. So whatever language of, of code you may be working with, um, you'll have some kind of plain text context. Um, and 
probably something like an API reference to document um, what what your um, library or what a library might might do, um, what calls it has that are available to people, what parameters each of these objects has, things like that. Um, so this is why I'm, I'm deciding to give a talk on Sphinx. Um, in particular, there's a number of doc uh, documentation generators out there, but Sphinx is one that I've seen used a lot. Um, and obviously, it you know, depends on your experience, um, what you work on. And I work a lot in Python, and it is a Python-based generator, but equally, um, it can be used to document um, tools in other languages. Um, so I've got some links at the bottom, which I won't go over in detail, but provided there um, as an example. Um, so the context of this demo, basically, um, we're going to be using a dummy project. Um, um, so basically, I've, I've chosen something um, kind of very basic, but it shows an example of a kind of code base that's slightly realistic in, in having a kind of object-oriented hierarchy. Um, so I'm calling it quadrilaterals. And basically, um, it is a kind of a hierarchy of different four-sided shapes, you know, sort of a square, a rectangle. Um, all the way down to things like yeah, a trapezium. Um, so in order to show you what I've got, let me just go back to the terminal here. So just doing an LS to show you what I've got. Um, so the, the actual code base itself is in this quadrilaterals um, directory. So let me just change in there. Now I'm going to run a command called tree, which is this useful command that shows you the kind of structure of uh, the directories underneath the one you're in the current directory. Um, oh, unfortunately, there's some. Um, yeah, you get obviously, well, if you're familiar with Python, you get pi um, c extensions. Um, let me just delete those. Sorry, when I was playing around before, I forgot to do that. Um, because that's kind of obscuring the structure we're meant to see. So I'm just running, ignore these commands. They're not relevant to the, to the um, demo at hand. So here's the structure without all those cogging everything up. Um, so it's just a basic code base where we have an init.py and then we have some uh, modules and within the modules that the various classes. Um, and it's kind of trying to model the structure of um, some parallelogram and trapezia and kites and various types of four sided shape. Um, now what I'm going to do just to show you because I'm aware there's probably some non non uh, native English speakers and they might not understand these these kind of words. Um, so uh, this is at this point I'm going to take the, the plain text I've got here and I'm going to show you uh, an example of what the built documentation from this will look like once it's converted to RST um, just as a, um, a demonstration of what we'll end up with by means of kind of a, an introduction and or summary. Um, so if I find the right um, browser. So this is the kind of thing we'll end up with from that text. Um, you can see we've got the same, well, you might not be able to see actually, I'll kind of um, move these around. So we've got a title, configuring Sphinx from scratch, a version that we'll add in once we convert to RST, um, some further texts. We can make notes stand out in these what are called admonitions, where we're actually saying, instead of just saying note that, as we've got here, you can actually highlight that it's a note. Uh, you can provide tips. You can put an image in. We'll do that in a second, though I don't think in this version there is um, the image, but I'll show you. Um, I'll quickly show you the link I've got to it, which is this is what the code base is uh, modeling. It's not the code base isn't relevant as such, but I want to have something vaguely realistic because we're going to generate an API reference um, to try and show. Um, uh, a kind of a, a structured API reference rather than just a, a flat linear one. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're modeling via these, um, uh, this kind of dummy code base. Uh, and this is roughly what we'll end up with. Um, so let me show you, I'll go back to the terminal really. Um, so this is in plain text. In order to generate content that's used in Sphinx, um, you need to convert it to what's called restructured uh, text. So that I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to the um, the repo um, center, and I've got this. Um, oh, actually, I'll build it into the docs. Okay, so the first thing I'd advise you do is you create a separate directory for your your documentation. Um, you don't have to do that, but it helps keep everything self-contained. I think that's quite standard to do. So let me just make a directory, call it docs, which is quite um, 
intuitive. So I'm going to change into it. Um, and just as I, as I was saying before, I'm going to show you how to convert to RST very quickly. Um, I've provided links as to you know a detailed reference, but just a very quick to get a feel of what uh, RST is. So I'm just going to call this context. Um, R, S, and T is the extension you'd use for, for restructured text. Henceforward, I'll probably be calling it RST. That's what I tend to call it. Um, so we're just going to convert this. I'm just going to copy all this text. Um, there's a an Emacs shortcut I could use. I feel like I'll mess it up. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this text. Um, so um, RST is quite similar to Markdown, and it's very there's a lot of elements in kind of plain text, so you you shouldn't it shouldn't look too it's not something you look at and be like, I don't understand any of that. So to provide a, an overall title, um, you do a double overlined, uh, sorry, an overline and underlined title version. Um, so actually this involves, I'll come back to this later, but you can reference things that you specify in the config. Um, I'll have to come back to that later, but this is the kind of what you use. This is all plain text, that's fine. Um, further headings. So this is a slightly, this is a subheading. Um, so you don't overline it, just give it another, um, just give that an underline in the same form. And then to do kind of sub subheadings, you use different characters. And I believe it doesn't actually matter which ones you use because Spinx will determine, um, determine what's more important, what's kind of a subheading rather than a sub subheading or, or similar uh, based on the order they're in. So say if we wanted to use a, um, another heading that's um, a level below context. You can just use any any real marker. I think there's some markers you can't use, but certainly hyphens fine. So that's just so. This is just a quick example. I'm not going to go over all the um, all the headings there, but um, that's what you do for the headings. Now you can do things such as put things in italics or bold. So one thing I was going to mention at the start. I'm actually not involved with Spinx. I, I don't develop Spinx. I just use it and I found it really useful. I noticed that a lot of other people are using it for their projects as well. So I thought I'll put that in a note. Um, now in plain text, you might say note that something, but actually in Spinx, you can highlight notes. Um, I'll show you this again. I think I'm, I demonstrated it briefly in the, um, the rendered um, kind of preview of what we'll end up with, but um, so this is the kind of thing you, you do. You tend to use a double dot and then some sort of keyword um, and then um, two, uh, two colons, something like that. So this is all in an RST reference and I'm not going to you know, have time to go over a whole RST reference, but that's the kind of thing you can do. There's another, another example I think I showed you, you can do a tip or there's other ones such as warnings. So you might want to highlight that something's you know, really important and that'll put it in a nice big red box usually, although it depends on the theme. Um, so yeah, so it's, do this one as a tip, but that's the kind of syntax you use just as a demonstration. Um, so I put that one in italics, just using some asterisks. Um, if you use these back ticks, you can get things in the kind of monospace kind of code like font. Um, so in Markdown, you can do things like this for, for code blocks for Sphinx you use um, this code admonitions, the keyword here is code. You can provide syntax highlighting, that's that's built into Spinx. Um, so let's just do, let's just say Python, all this is kind of an example in code. So uh, this is a, an example of the code base and how it'd be used. So uh, it's in plain text, it's quite difficult to comprehend. So I'm just gonna, um, oh, it's a whole bit, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna, I'll not discuss it. And then when we build the documentation, it should become more obvious what that is. Um, oh, sorry. I'm... Yeah, you need to indent things. You need to be careful with indentation for RST. Um... There we go. And I think we've pretty much got things um, RST-ified, so to speak. Um, now I've got some links here with Sphinx, you can use kind of hyperlinks and things, but I've just written the links out in full um, just to demonstrate that the Sphinx will convert these automatically to um, to HTML. And right, very nearly there. And then we can show um, 
an example of how to very quickly get some documentation up uh, using Sphinx. Possibly shouldn't have put quite so much content here, but this is all the background to the talk and lots of useful information that if you wanted to come back to this would be really, you notice I'm using a different character here because these are uh, different levels of headings. So this is, um, like I say, there's a hierarchy, you use different characters to underline and it will provide a subheading or a sub subheading and so on. Um, so that's pretty much it, RSTified. So let's, let me go back to the terminal, Just show you what I've got now. So I've just got one RST file there. Um, and I will manage that later. For now, we're going to just get started with um, building the documentation. Um, and what, what's really good about Sphinx is they provide this command you can use that will get everything set up. Um, so you don't have to kind of fiddle around or follow lots of steps. Um, so I'm going to assume you've got Sphinx installed. Um, I think, yeah, th th there should be a link to it um, in, the, in the abstract of this talk. I've already installed it in a virtual em environment. Um, so yeah, make sure you've got that installed. Obviously, all this command won't work. But the command is called Sphinx uh, Quick Start. Notice there's a hyphen in the in the middle. It's not two separate um, um, words there. So I'm just going to run that. Um, remember, we're in a separate docs directory because it helps to keep everything contained. Because this is going to auto generate some directories for us. Um, okay, so the quick start utility is basically it's giving us some questions. It's telling us, um, essentially, you know, it's saying, well, customize it according to what your project is called and who you are as the author. Um, so separate source and build directories. I like to do that, but it's uh, you don't have to because the, the source is the RST and various content. The build is the actual built uh, content. So HTML, LaTeX, what, what have it. Okay, so like I say, the dummy project we have is quadrilaterals. Um, author name, uh, just give my first name. Release, not too important. But obviously, um, you put the right values in for your, for your project. English, so you can do other, you can use other languages. Um, okay, so as it says here, finished an initial directory structure has been created. So if we now um, ls to check what we have in our directory, it's actually created some directories and they are populated with some things. Now the key one to look at straight away um, is source uh, and conf. So this is the configuration file, as the name hopefully suggests. Uh, oh, sorry, this text is so small. Hopefully everyone can read it. I, obviously I've, I've increased the text in my terminal. Um, but as you can see, it's been auto-populated by Sphinx to contain some of those answers we put in there. Um, I should, po I'll point out two things that we're gonna come back to in particular. Um, although this is all just kind of configuration items you can change. Um, so extensions is one thing we're gonna come back to. This is uh, where you can use, you know, essentially as a, a plugins and external uh, third party extensions that can customize um, the capability or the look or various things. Uh, the other one, theme. So. When you build to HTML, you can have various themes and it's provided us with the default, which is called Alabasta. Um, but I'll show you an example of changing that. Um, okay, so that's the configuration. Um, I'll just um, minimize that to show you, I guess the other most important thing for now is under source, we have this index. So the index, notice that it's created in an RST format, uh, like with our context file that we're gonna use in a second. Um, so this is the very basic thing it sets up and what you need to do when you're just developing your, your um, content and adding your first pages is you need to add it to this TOC tree. So that's table of contents tree. Um, as per this, this caption, you know, contents. Um, so um, what I want to do is add my context to, uh, RST file to the contents so we can just render that. Um, first, we have to move it because it's currently outside of the source directory and all of your source files need to be in the source directory unless you um, find some fancy way to specify otherwise. So let me just move the context into source. Um, great. And now we can just specify that that should be in the contents. The index is always in the context by definition. Um, it's kind of the root page, um, this index.rst. So it's a special file. 
but we can add our context. Now you don't need the RST extension, you just need to provide the name that's identical to how you've named your file, in which case we have a uh, context there. Excellent, so now we can do our, we can try out our first build. Um, this will be a very basic build, but it should have up the context in. Um, so the commands to use, and, and these are all documented by Sphinx, but, um, just to make it clear what these are. Um, so generally, if you've obviously, if you've already built your, your documentation, you want to just quick, do a quick make clean to make sure everything's wiped in the build directory. I don't need to do that now because it's um, obviously already clean, but let me just do that anyway to show you um, as an illustration. And then make HTML. So this is going to build HTML, which is um, what you'd view in a browser. But I'll show you as well that you can, there's various other options that you can um, generate the RST into. So um, so, you know, HTML and LaTeX are some examples, but there's a really quite large number of options that you can use. I'm just use, choosing these two as they're quite uh, intuitive. Okay, so let me run the make. So that's all worked out well. And let me just, um, no, never mind. Um, do you maybe, yeah, well, maybe I'll show you just to do the, to build in LaTeX, just put make LaTeX. It's, it's quite intuitive there. So that's also done. And now I'm going to open both. So again, remember we have the source where we've got all the um, the origin RST and, and content, and then the build is where we have everything. So let me just open um, what we've just generated for the HTML first. Um, it tells you where it should go. Um, well, at the end of this, you know, the build process, for example, it says in here HTML pages are in build HTML. Um, the LaTeX is there. The index page is the kind of the root page to open. And all the HTML files will have the same um, root name, just with .html in the end, um, same as same as the RST. So there's a very basic example of some, say, fairly ugly looking, but you know, a, a working documentation. Um, just quickly show you. So this this is bit at the bottom which, where it says powered by Sphinx. Um, and I was just going to show you. I think I meant to do this at the start, but I got slightly uh, sidelined. Um, that I had some links at the bottom showing examples of Sphinx generated documentation. Now there's a huge master list that Sphinx provided themselves um, here, but also um, just some really prominent examples. There's Python, uh, well Python three, the latest Python. Generally, if you try to, if you suspect that something might be made with Sphinx. And it's difficult to tell because, uh, as I'll try and show in a second, there's lots of different customization options for the look and feel and the capability. Um, but one way that it's easy to tell is if you go most documentation, I mean, some might hide this, but there's a bit at the bottom that says created using Sphinx and then some version. So that's there with Python. Um, I'll show you another example. Um, um, let me just do Jupyter Hub as another one. Scrolling to the bottom, created using Sphinx there. So that's a little clue. And sometimes I like, if I see some documentation, I just think, oh, I bet this is made with Sphinx. And you can just you know, find that little uh, uh, item at the bottom. Um, I was missing link there, but never mind. Um, OK, so this is the, the, you know, the, the documentation we just generated. So you can see, if you remember me highlighting that you can provide kind of notes as, as um, admonitions, as they call them, that puts it in a little box. A tip similarly. Some themes colour these differently so you can kind of distinguish. This code block that I was mentioning is quite difficult to comprehend in plain text. It's been um, <laughs> rendered in in monospace here so that's all nice and easy to read. Um, the links have been rendered. You can actually put hyperlinks on to make it less kind of messy so you might hyperlink that with this link but this is just to kind of show um, roughly what's happening. Right so that's something very basic. Let me just um, Oh, I'll quickly yeah, demonstrate that the LaTeX was built as well. Uh, it's not under LaTeX. Um, yeah, I'm not doing very well for time, so I'm not gonna... Um... Hmm. Oh, otherwise I'm not finding that. Am I calling it the wrong thing? Uh, okay, well, let me just open. I'll open any max, and you can see the kind of the horrible unrendered LaTeX, just as a demonstration that it is LaTeX there. See, so all that ugliness is clearly LaTeX. 
and it will render to PDF and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so we've made um, some HTML, some LaTeX. Like I say, I'm going to try to speed up a bit because I'm not doing very well for time. Um, one thing I just want to quickly show you is a very basic customization is a change of theme. Um, so in your conf.py, um, default theme is this one called Alabaster. Uh, another common one I'll show you, um, and, and a lot of these um, are just built into Spinks. You don't need to install, but a very common one that you do need to install and I'll show is called Read the Docs. Um, let me just, sorry, this is a separate file. I'm just using copy from, so I don't get the things wrong. Um, so this is actually an extension you have to provide because it's a separate, um, it's not built in with Sphinx. So the Sphinx RTD theme, provide that in the extensions list. You need to install it. And I think, sorry, just let me check. Yes, I installed this earlier. So it's already there, but you would run um, pip install Sphinx RTD theme. Um, and if you run that and specify that as your, sorry, I'm in the wrong bit, as your theme there, then when you do a make of um, HTML, well, a make clean, do the clean first to wipe everything uh, that was there beforehand. And then when you run make HTML again, um, just opening it up. Uh, oh, interesting. That's, have I not specified it somehow? Yeah, it should have changed the theme, but it didn't. So I'm slightly confused. Oh yes, because you actually, actually as well as specifying it as extension, you actually have to specify it as the theme you want to use naturally. I forgot to do that. So try once more. Um, yeah, so you can see I've kept something up from before. So hopefully you can see what it did look like. Yeah, so that's what it did look like. Obviously, if I refresh the page, it'll go back to this because they're the same thing. But um, But this is the same content, a different theme. Um, let's just show you this page of the, the context. You can see notes and tips and things um, rendered differently, but you've still got the common themes such as, you know, code examples and you know, links being rendered and a navigation section, which is quite useful. Having a little sidebar, we can click on all the subheadings and get to them really easily. Um, so that's the theme. Um, so let me just, so the main, thing I wanted to show you and if we're not doing well for time maybe this can be the final thing or maybe one other quick thing I can do um, which shouldn't take long is to show you an API reference because thinking about documentation in a in an abstract sense the kind of things that you would want to document are you know some context especially if there's a research software you'd want to you know describe how it relates to some sort of scholarly effort you know science scientific or, or whatever um, you want to provide installation instructions um maybe some um help guides to people who want to, to contribute you know developers uh, but i think one of the most important things is an api reference to actually tell um users you know what they can um well about the api what they can um call and what functionality you have and what the you know the return outputs might be from um certain methods and so on um so let me quickly sh quickly show you that um, so this will involve, let me change into the source directory this time. Um, so we're going to create a new page, again in RST, let's call it API reference. Um, there we go, just give it a title quickly. I'm just going to, because I'm low on time, just going to call it a very short title API. Um, now, what instead of copying kind of things that are already in the code base, you want to auto generate it from doc strings, which you can do. So we're gonna, the two extensions we're going to use, again, I'm just copying them from something I've done previously, auto doc and auto summary. Now, again, you need to install these separately, but um, they're very useful ones to have. So add them to your extensions list uh, there. You need to install them. Now I've already done that, but let me just show you the roughly the commands. So it would be, um, um oh sorry yeah okay well you need to install them i installed them a long time ago on this one so that's fine um but the the extensions all have their own kind of documentation that you can use um I'll just get rid of that um so we've got our api reference page now 
remember the index, which is the main bit. So add that to the contents uh, table of contents list in the index. Remember, you don't need the RST extension. So that's now going to show up, but it doesn't have any, a reference in yet. That's what we're about to add. Um, let me find it. Here we go. Um, so now there's a certain um, uh, reference that you need to put in order to um, get the um, API to, to show up. Um, and I've done one earlier because this would take quite a while to, to um, type out. But what I'll do is I'll explain it as I go. Um, so you provide an admonition to uh, define what your module's called. So mine's called quadrilaterals, um, as I was saying before. Um, in this case, let's document the API of the classes. You can also do modules or separate functions. Um, so there's all sorts of options available, but let's just do the classes here. So I've added these classes already in from um, what I have in the, in the quadrilaterals code base. Save me typing those all out. Um, and we're using auto summary, which is a, um, as I say, an extension that we've added to our extensions list. So it's now going to be recognized. Um, so that's all good. So the first thing you have to do, and this is quite important, when you want to um, do a, an auto-generated API references, you need to create some stub files, basically kind of files that um, Sphinx or the Sphinx extension passes your code base, finds all the classes, and gives them this kind of stub, which is just used to um, create the documentation from. So let me get the command. Um, so I provided links to, to help with this, but there's a, a command you'd run called Sphinx autogen. Uh, am I in the right place? I think I am. Okay, excellent. So we run that command. Um, and as you can see, it's auto generated some stubs for us based on uh, what we specified. So we've got, it's putting them this in this generated directory. Yeah, we've got quadrilateral, we've got a kite here, we've got a, a rectangle. So all the various things we specified there. Um, so let me just show. Yeah, so they're all in this generated directory that it's created. Now, if we go back to our docs directory, this is where we were running the make commands because this is where we've got the make file. Um, so you need to be with the make file in order to run these. Now we should, I think, be able to run, uh, obviously do a clean, but then run make, make HTML and the API reference should show up. So let's try it. Um, we're getting some, yeah, we're getting some warnings here now. At the moment, there we don't have to worry about those because it's all it's saying is that we haven't explicitly put um, the, these various classes in our table of contents, which is something you would do. But obviously, there's quite a lot of them. I'm not going to do that now, just to give a demonstration. But that's that's just a warning that we haven't done that. It's telling us to do that, which is very useful. But I don't have time to do it now, basically. Um, right. So that's where. Let me open up the documentation again in the browser. Um, so here we are, we have a new um, item API for the API reference. And as you can see, it's documented, um, well, it's provided a summary table first, but these are all clickable. So um, taking this quadrilateral as, as an example, um, click there, and it's actually taken the signature um, and the doc string from the code base. So I haven't hard coded any of that into the, the, um, the configuration or the source for the documentation. It's just Auto generated it, uh, which is really nice. And it's recognized that in the doc string, we had a code block here. And it's rendered that too. Um, so it's all, you know, it, it's doing the kind of things that we might have to do by hand otherwise. And it's making it really simple to do. Um, so, one final thing again, I'm, I'm wary of time. I'll show you quickly one other extension that's a simple one. Um, what I want to show, if I had more time, I would show that you can dem um, generate diagrams. Um, this is another cool extension I found and I thought was really, really useful. Um, you can actually generate class diagrams or UML of the, um, the kind of the module structure um, and just process these into your documentation. And they'd be like with this API reference, if something changes in the code base, just rebuild and that'll all be reflected in the documentation. So you don't have to manually edit anything when you're changing your code, which is super useful. Um, okay, so the final thing I was gonna show just again, because I'm not doing very much time. Um, I want some time for questions. So going back to the, the config again, so the conf.py. 
Um, so just to demonstrate one very simple extension I find really useful. Um, again, I'm just going to copy it from here so I don't have to copy it out. So maybe I'll try two. Let's see that. These two are quite similar, but um, very useful, I think. So I'm adding two more extensions, called one called copy, copy button, one called to toggle prompt. Um, you would need to install these, but I've done that before. So it would just be a pip install on those. And I'll provide the links to these extensions of the documentation. Um, um, so I've added those to the extensions. These are the ones where we don't, we can configure them a bit more, but we don't need to do anything more. So all I'm going to do now is do a make clean again uh, and a make HTML. Again, they're those warnings that um, I can't address, but I don't have time to. Um, so just actually, I guess I need to refresh what I've got, can't I, instead of rerunning that. Excellent. So you might have been, if you were eagle-eyed, notice the simple change that that we had between between the refresh, which is that in the corner of our code block, we've got it's actually two symbols. They're kind of almost overlaid, and um, what you do in real life is configure that so you can move the button out. Do you know what think? I might be able to quickly give an example of um, what we have in our in a code base I develop. Um, um, let me just get the documentation up quickly, just to show uh, an example of, of this with the, um, the two buttons slightly out, because it might be that we can't press one of them. Um, yeah, so in this example that I'm showing, we've got the two buttons and we've configured it so that you can move, move one out. Um, but just going back here, um, so this is a code block we have. Um, and what this button does is it just toggles between um, this Python console prompt and it hides the output. So that means that a user, I mean, in this case, it's a very simple little code thing. It wouldn't take long to copy and paste, but say you had a big, long um, example. Oh, and actually, I think we do in the page, the content page we created. So let me just show that. Um, yeah, so if you had a long piece of code that you know showcases what the project might do, um, it makes it a lot easier if you just toggle that off and then a user can just copy. Um, well, they can copy all that, but also this copy button extension, which copies it all for them. So instead of having to do all the faff of copying every single line to you know, not copy the console uh, prompt, you can hide that, then press this copy button. And just to show you again, you know, in, in a real documentation, you configure it easily in the conf.py for that extension just to not them not to be kind of sitting on top of each other there. Um, but yeah, so that's a quick example of some other, a lot more uh, simple, but um, equally really useful extensions. Um, and one thing I wanted to emphasize, just going back to the built docs, I've provided some links here in the kind of context, uh, context page um, that awful, an awful lot of documentation is generated by Sphinx. Um, you can do some really advanced things either built into Sphinx itself or using extensions. Um, you could even create your own if you feel there's a, a need for one that uh, you know that hasn't been created yet. And, and people do contribute to, to that community by creating some really useful extensions. Um, uh, I, put a, you know, I put an example of some of the ones that um, I've shown you here. And yeah, so I think, that, I think that's it really. I mean, unfortunately, I've only had time to showcase some very basic customizations. I think I was a bit optimistic about how much I could fit in 30 minutes. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully that's given you an idea. And I will push up everything from um, from this repository I've got here. Let me just get back to the root of the repository. Um, I'll push all of this up so that if you wanted to have a play around yourself, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, yeah, so thank you. And sorry for running over time. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you so much. Can we all give uh, Sadie a virtual round of applause? I think that's the one thing everybody misses from in-person events is that actual like... <laughs> yeah, I'm just um, thinking of virtual feedback. applause and I don't hear anything and it's a bit scary. But. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Sadie. Um, Great. Uh, we do have uh, one question in the chat so far. So I'll ask um, Andrea, would you like to unmute and voice your question?
If not, I can read yeah. it out loud. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you? Yeah. No, I was, I was just wondering. Uh, I didn't use so, so much documentation system, but I was wondering if you know some pro and cons. Um, I know some people use MKit docs. Or I heard yeah. also about, I don't know, docu service or something. I don't know. Maybe you know uh, some differences between. Kind of admittedly I, I, admitting my bias here but i i think i worked with M mk docs once i haven't worked with any other documentation generators as such although i guess it's uh, kind of arbitrary as what you define as a documentation generator um because really it's just something that processes content um i guess i gave a talk on spigs because um as i might have touched upon i i've seen it used um in an awful for an awful lot of projects um and I find it really intuitive to use. So, for example, that quick start command, um, it just makes it, you know, it, it essentially creates the infrastructure for you that you just have to customize in a very simple way and your content's, you know, up. Um, so it's not to say that there aren't other really excellent um, documentation generators out there. Um, unfortunately, I don't know much about MK Docs. I don't know if anyone in the, the any participants um, have experience with that and um, would like to kind of, convey that then they're welcome to um otherwise i'll just assume i mean i can try and get back to you i can kind of look into the the differences um because i feel that, like i say I, I feel like sphinx oh i've got the impression that sphinx is really popular um at this point and i feel like there must be a reason people are converging on it as opposed to other documentation generators So sorry, that doesn't particularly answer your question, but I just I don't have that much experience with with the uh, MK Docs or um, other generators. But equally, if anyone does, uh, feel free to uh, um, chip in. I just I've noticed another question. Just to say, someone's asking, saying the repo is empty. Yeah, I haven't I haven't pushed things up yet, just because I wanted to wait until I'd done the talk in case. Well, I just feel like it's inevitable that something goes wrong and you have to change something slightly. So I'll push it up in. So maybe an hour, I'll have it up, but it will be up there. Um, let me just check the other questions. Do we have any other questions for Sadie? If there aren't more questions, I can try and showcase something else to fill the time, but people might be, you know, raring to go. Um, uh, people might be like, Anna, oh, I don't want to hear anymore. Anastasis has a question. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the for the intro, Sadie. That was great. Um, I I was wondering what kind of feedback you're getting when your RST or something else in somewhere in all the sources is wrong. Does it does the build generally go through and then you have to inspect the pages, or do you get an, an error message? And if so, how meaningful do they tend to be? Because I know that from experience, sometimes you get something very cryptic if you're not familiar with the with the file format. But other times, maybe it's it's something friendlier. Indeed, no, it's a really good question, actually, um, and. Yeah, it's a really relevant one because this is one of the things that's great about Sphinx is if you get something, um, you know, like you say, if there's some formatting error in your RST, it will warn you. Um, so I think I showed with a build. Am I right for this question to kind of share my screen again just to demonstrate something quickly? Yeah, um, excellent. Let me just quickly go back. Um, so at the end of my demonstration, I, you know, the build was given these warnings. Um, this is about the... Um, things not being in the table of contents tree, uh, but say I'll probably show you if you just if the RST itself is badly formatted, it will give you lots of feedback about that. Um, so I just try and quickly show you. I'll not go overboard, but I'll just bodge something and make it um, kind of make it badly formatted. Um, so so say this heading wasn't quite right. So it needs to be the same uh, length as the actual text is one thing. So say there was one one out there. Um, say we had a spurious kind of back tick there. Uh, what else could I do to break things? Yeah, say the indentation was wrong here. Um, and uh, well, I guess that'll do. OK, so I've broken some things. Actually, I'll remove one of these asterisks. Um, just want to make clean. Okay, so now if I run the build again, um, 
Oh, I'm in the wrong I'm in the wrong place. Yes, sorry, I need to go one directory up. So when you're running these make commands, just remember you need to be with the make file in the same directory. Um, um, okay, so if I run that again, um, I'm not sure if you've got the... No, oh, let's move that there. Um, so you'll see... Oh, we've got some of the warnings we had before about the, the top tree. But um, So here's some of the warnings that are generated from the, from the RST itself. Um, yeah, so there's one, one might be an error actually, it's, or it's come up at least in a, some sort of other emphasis in terms of the styling. But so it's saying there's a start string without an end string. Um, inline emphasis is this asterisk here. So it's, it's picked up on that. Uh, title underline too short. So that's from when we cut that off. And um, interpret text without a, so that's, yeah, similarly when we just had the spur spurious backtick there. Um, content block expected for the tip directive, non found. So that's uh, getting at the fact we've got the indentation wrong here because it has to be indented with the start of the keyword um, like I had before. So, yeah, hopefully that's just kind of a, de a quick demonstration that it is giving you a lot of feedback. I think you can tailor the feedback. So, if you were like, if you didn't want all that information, you could um, disable it in some way. But yeah. it is really good at um, kind of indicating what might be wrong. Yeah, um, so that looks great. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. Um, let me try and get the. Oh, I'm sharing my screen, aren't I? Slightly lost there. So we um, have some questions from uh, Kat Smith. Kat, do you want to unmute, or would you prefer me to ask your question? Uh, so the question is, do you have any experience of using Sphinx with other languages such as JavaScript? So I don't personally, but um, one of the links I found, um, slightly old actually, which is unfortunate, but um, I did find a link where someone had kind of documented use of Sphinx with other languages. Um, so I mean, for JavaScript, I think it shouldn't be um, too difficult. I, I was thinking if you have a compiled language, so if it was something like C++, you might need other either extensions or other tools to help you manage the uh, the compilation and various complications around that. Um, but let me just see if I can find um, a link. Yeah, so I, I do have a link to someone who had done a quick blog about um, doing it to use um, to document a C++ um, language, which is this, just I'll not go over it, but here's a there's a quick blog there. JavaScript, I don't, but I'm thinking there might be, I mean, because, you know, JavaScript is one of the most popular languages um, out there. So I would think it's likely that um, Sphinx have got extensions or people have created other tools to kind of interface with Sphinx to help document JavaScript. So I'm sorry I can't provide a particularly um, useful answer myself, um, but I can I can look into that if, if anyone would find that interesting. Although it might just be the case of kind of Googling um, Sphinx and JavaScript extensions. So my, I guess my answer is I would suspect so, but I, yeah, I'm not certain. Um, we have oh, a thanks, question. Kat. We have a question from uh, Schwab. Does Sphinx support macros? I'm not sure. I, I guess, sorry, I'm not too, again, I'm not too helpful on this one, but I suspect it does. If it doesn't, you could write your own extension to um, to do that. I mean, I, I guess it depends also what form a macro um, you're particularly um, interested in, or you, you know you're considering there. Um, I'm not. I'm not sharing my screen. I'm like, I was going to quickly. I feel like I've seen this somewhere in Sphinx. Um, yeah, I mean, a quick. I'll just do a quick Google to suggest there are. Um, some macro um, capabilities, uh, RST Sphinx macros. Not not an insult to anyone's capabilities that they can't just Google something, but more just to give a try and give a kind of an immediate um, gauge of what the answer might be. So I'm sorry I'm not too um, clued up on the full capabilities, but I guess the thing is with Sphinx, there's uh, new extensions being created all the time. It's you know it's an active development, um, especially as lots of people. Or increasing numbers that are using it. Um, one of the things when people, you know, use a tool more and more, and it gets more and more popular, there's more of a community push to kind of 
um, add capabilities that are useful for, for lots of people. So again, sorry, a slightly um, not particularly useful answer, but that's, that's as much as I know. No problem. Um, any other final questions for Sadie? If not, can we uh, thank Sadie again? Virtual round of applause with no sound. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, I'll imagine it. <laughs> excellent. Um, so I'll just share my screen.